Hello, I am Professor Sims, and this video is about diseases of the immune system. This is the third of ten lessons included in my pathogenic microbiology course. If you're currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and the course Moodle site for assignments and other information. We previously discussed uh, mechanisms by which innate and adaptive immune defenses um, are conducted in the body. The learning objectives for this unit are going to be to identify and compare distinguishing characteristics, mechanisms, and examples of type 1, 2, 3, and 4 hypersensitivities. We will explain why the autoimmune disorders develop. We'll discuss examples of organ-specific and systemic autoimmune diseases. The importance of human leukocyte antigens, HLAs, and tissue transplantation, grafts, and the potential for immune interactions. What occurs during graft versus host defense? Causes and treatments of primary, secondary immunodeficiencies, how adaptive specific immune response responds to tumors, and we will talk about the risks and benefits of tumor vaccines. So, like I said, we previously discussed mechanisms by which adaptive immune defenses, how they protect us from infectious disease. However, the same protective immune defenses can also be responsible for undesirable reactions called hypersensitivity reactions. Hypersensitivity reactions are classified by their immune mechanism. So, uh, your type 1 hypersensitivity reactions involve immunoglobulin E, antibody against soluble antigen triggering mast cell degranulation. Type 2 hypersensitivity reactions involve IgG and IgM antibodies, and these are directed against cellular antigens leading to cell damage mediated by other immune system effectors. Type 3 hypersensitivity involves interactions of IgG, IgM, and occasionally IgA antibodies to form immune complexes, and the accumulation of the immune complexes in tissue leads to tissue damage mediated by other immune system effectors. And finally, type 4 hypersensitivity reactions are T-cell mediated. Uh, they can involve the tissue damage mediated by activated macrophages inside toxic T-cells. So we're going to discuss all four of these types of hypersensitivities. Um, this figure here, 19.1, this is... Um, talking about one type of type 1 hypersensitivity, and it has to do with allergies. An allergy is an adaptive immune response, can be life-threatening. I myself have a, a type 1 hypersensitivity to bee venom. Bee stings can cause life-threatening systemic allergic reactions. And it says here that sensitive individuals may need to carry an epinephrine auto-injector, also known to to most of us as an EpiPen in case of a bee sting. The hypersensitivity immune response to bee venom, it can be very severe. It can lead to a severe drop in blood pressure, and, and that is a result from the host, the host immune response. A presensitized individual, okay, so what that means is a susceptible individual, someone who is susceptible to hypersensitivity. So for susceptible individuals, the first exposure to an allergen activates a strong Th2 cell response. Um, so you have cytokines, interleukin, IL-4, and interleukin IL-13. From the T cells activate B cells specific to the same allergen, and the result is clonal, prolifer clonal proliferation, differentiation into plasma cells. And then antibody class switch from production of IgM to production of IgE. On subsequent exposure, allergens, allergens bind to multiple IgE molecules on mast cells. This results in a cross-linking of the IgE molecules. And within minutes, this cross-linking of IgE activates the mast cells and triggers degranulation. And that is a reaction in which the contents of the granules in the mast cells are released into the extracellular environment. The chemical mediators released by mast cells collectively cause inflammation and signs and symptoms associated with the type 1 hypersensitivity reactions. Um, histamine stimulates mucus, mucus secretion in nasal passages 
and tear formation from lacrimal glands promoting runny nose, watery eyes of allergen. Interaction of histamine with nerve endings causes the itching and sneezing that you often have with allergies. And then vaso vasodilation caused by um, several of the chemical mediators. This results in hives, headaches, angioedema, and hypotension. Uh, bronchial constriction caused by some of the chemical mediators leads to wheezing, uh, difficulty breathing, coughing, and in very severe cases, uh, bluish color to the skin or mucous membrane, so you can start turning blue. Vomiting can result from stimulation of the vomiting center in the cerebellum by histamine and serotonin. Histamine can also cause relaxation of intestinal smooth muscles and diarrhea. Type 1 hypersensitivity reactions such as these can be localized or they can be systemic and quite dangerous. Type 2 hypersensitivities or cytotoxic hypersensitivities are mediated by IgG and IgM antibodies that bind to cell surface antigens and can either activate complement, um, resulting in inflammatory response and lysis of targeted cells, or they can be involved in antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, antibody-dependent cell media, cell-mediated cytotoxicity, uh, also known as ADCC, with cytotoxic T cells. A unique characteristic of type 3 hypersensitivity is antibody excess, primarily IgG, that is coupled with a relatively low concentration of antigen, resulting in the formation of small immune complexes that deposit on the surface of epithelial cells, lining the lumen of small blood vessels, or on the surface of tissue. Systemic type 3 hypersensitivity is called serum sickness, and that is uh, when immune complexes deposit in various body sites, resulting in a more generalized systemic inflammatory response. Uh, the mechanisms of serum sickness are similar to those described in localized type, type 3 hypersensitivity, but they involve widespread activation of mast cells, complement, neutrophils, and macrophages. And this causes tissue destruction in areas like the kidneys, the joints, the blood vessels. Uh, symptoms of serum sickness include chills, fever, rash, and arthritis. Type 4 hypersensitivities are regulated by T cells, and they involve the action of effector cells. These types of hypersensitivities are organized into subcategories based on T cell subtype and or the type of antigen and the resulting effector mechanism. So there's a really good breakdown of all these types of hypersensitivities in a really, really big table in the book that was too large for me to include in the slides. It is uh, table 19.5 in the textbook. So this is um, a schematic of type 1 hypersensitivity. So what it's showing here is that on the first exposure, the antigen presenting cells present epic epitopes with the major histocompatibility complex 2 and the helper T cells. B cells also process and present the same epitope to the Th2 cells and that releases the cytokines that stimulate proliferation into the IgE secreting plasma cells. The IgE molecules bind to mast cells and that sensitizes them for activation uh, with subsequent exposure. This is the type 2 cytotoxic hypersensitivities resulting from antibodies that bind to antigens and initiate cytotoxic responses. This is an example uh, of hemolytic transfusion reaction and hemolytic disease of a newborn. So red blood cells have many different glycoprotein, glycolipid molecules on their surface. In some surface molecules of red blood cells called blood group antigens, uh, they have various functions, including transportation of glucose and ions across the cytoplasmic membrane. There are several sets of blood group antigens that vary in complexity. Um, and this is, uh, this is having to do with the ABO group system. It is pretty famous and consists of just two antigens arbitrarily given the names. A and B. So each person's red blood cells have either an A antigen, a B antigen, 
both A and B antigens, or they have neither A or B antigens, and that is when uh, you would call it blood type O. So as you probably know, blood can be transfused from one person to another. However, if blood is transfused to an individual with a different blood type, then the donor's blood group antigen. We stimulate production of antibodies on the recipient, and then these bind to and eventually destroy the transfused cells. Um, the result is a potentially life-threatening situation. Uh, note here that it is a blood recipient's own immune system that causes problems. The donated cells merely trigger the response. Figure 19.6 is having to do with the Rh system. The Rh system of red blood cells and their antigens is, is really complex and it has to do with the classification of cells as being either Rh positive or Rh negative. And in this situation where we have um, complement mediated hemolysis between a mother and her baby. So like ABO incompatibility is blood transfusions from a donor with the wrong Rh factor antigens can cause a type 2 hypersensitivity uh, hemolytic reaction. The Rh factor incompatibility between a mother and her fetus can also cause type 2 hypersensitivity, referred to as hemolytic disease of the newborn. If an Rh negative woman carries an Rh positive baby a term, the mother's immune system can be exposed to Rh positive fetal red blood cells. And this exposure usually occurs during the last trimester of pregnancy and during the delivery process. Um, but if the exposure occurs, the Rh positive fetal red blood cells will activate a primary adaptive immune response in the mother. And the anti Rh factor IgG antibodies will be produced. IgG antibodies are the only class of antibody that can cross the placenta from mother to fetus. But in most cases, the first Rh positive baby is unaffected by these antibodies because first exposure is usually late enough in the pregnancy that the mother does not have time to mount a sufficient primary antibody response before the baby is born. The bad news is that if a subsequent pregnancy with an Rh positive fetus occurs, the mother's second exposure to the Rh factor antigens causes a strong secondary antibody response that produces larger quantities of anti-H factor IgG, and then these antibodies can cross the placenta from mother to fetus and cause the hemolytic disease of the newborn, and yet it is potentially lethal for the baby. Type 3 hypersensitivities can affect the lung, causing a form of pneumonia called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Individuals become sensitized when minute mold spores or other antigens are inhaled deep into the lungs, and this stimulates the production of antibodies. A hypersensitive reaction occurs when the subsequent inhalation of the same antigen stimulates the formation of immune complexes, and then that activates the complement. One form of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is shown in the figure here, is called farmer's lung. This occurs in farmers that are chronically exposed to spores from moldy hay, and it can lead to lung cancer um, in more severe cases. It can also cause fever, cough, and it also can destroy lung tissue, and in some cases it has even destroyed part of the ribs. Glomerulonephritis occurs when immune complexes circulating in the bloodstream are deposited in the walls of glomeruli. Glomeruli are networks of minute blood vessels in the kidneys. Immune complexes damage the glomerular cells leading to enhanced local production of cytokines that trigger nearby cells to produce more of the proteins that underlie the cells. And what that does is it impedes blood filtration by the kidneys. So sometimes the immune complexes are deposited in the center of the glomeruli where they stimulate local cells to divide and compress nearby blood vessels, again interfering with kidney function. The net result is kidney failure. Uh, the glomeruli lose their ability to filter waste from the blood, and this is one reason why um, dialysis can become necessary, and it can ultimately result in death.
Figure 19.8 shows some examples of type 4 hypersensitivities. Um, remember, these are not medi mediated by antibodies, but by helper T cells, uh, which activate macrophages and eosinophils and cytotoxic T cells. So an example of this is being exposed to um, poison ivy, which causes contact dermatitis. Contact dermatitis is a type 4 hypersensitivity. I've included this table here, um, just kind of gives a nice summary of the different types of hypersensitivities, the immune, um, mecha the mechanisms of the immune system that causes the hypersensitivities, and then what types of injury, what type of symptoms um, accompany these types of hypersensitivities. So type 1, 2, and 3 are all antibody mediated. Type 4, remember, is T cell. Figure 1912 is an example of a diagnosis of hypersensitivities. Diagnosis of type 1 hypersensitivities is a complex process. It requires several diagnostic tests in addition to a well documented patient history. Serum IgE levels can be measured, but elevated IgE alone does not confirm allergic diseases. So as part of the process to identify the antigens responsible for type 1 reaction allergies, testing through a prick puncture skin test or an intradermal test can be performed. The uh, prick puncture skin test, PPST, is carried out with the introduction of allergens in a series of several superficial, superficial skin pricks on the patient's back or arms, in this case, in the arms. PPSTs are considered to be the most convenient and least expensive way to diagnose allergies. Autoimmune diseases are those in which the body is attacked by its own adaptive immune response. In, norm in normal, uh, healthy states, the immune system induces tolerance, which is a lack of anti-self-immune response. But with autoimmunity, there's a loss of immune tolerance and the mechanisms that are responsible for autoimmune disease include type 1, no, sorry, type 2, 3, and 4 hypersensitivity reactions. Uh, autoimmune diseases can have a variety of mixed symptoms that flare up and disappear, and this makes diagnosis difficult. The causes of autoimmune diseases are a combination of the individual's genetic makeup, the effect of environmental influences such as sunlight, infections, medications, environmental chemicals. Uh, the vagueness of this list reflects our poor understanding of the etiology of these diseases. So except in a very, spew, a, a very few specific cases, the initiation events of most autoimmune diseases are not fully understood or characterized. There are several possible causes for the origin of autoimmune diseases and Autoimmunity is likely due to several factors. We have evidence now that suggests that the regulatory T and B cells play a central role in the maintenance of tolerance and in the prevention of autoimmune responses. The regulatory T cells are especially important for inhibiting autoreactive T cells that are not eliminated during thymic selection and escape from the thymus. So, if none of what I just said made sense to you, you may want to go back and review the T lymphocytes and cellular immunity uh, that we discussed in the first two lessons. Now, the antigen mimicry between pathogen antigens and our own self antigens can lead to cross-reactivity and autoimmunity. Um, hidden self antigens can become exposed because of trauma, uh, drug interactions, different disease states, and this can trigger the autoimmune response. Um, all of those factors contribute to autoimmunity, but ultimately damage to tissues and organs in the autoimmune system comes as a result of inflammation, inflammatory responses that are inappropriate, in excess, and uh, treatment often includes immunosuppressive drugs and corticosteroids. Some autoimmune diseases are considered organ-specific, which means that the immune system is targeting specific organs or specific tissues. Examples of organ-specific autoimmune diseases include celiac disease, 
Hashimoto's, Graves disease, uh, the different types of thyroid, thyroiditis, um, and then your type 1 diabetes and Addison disease. Systemic autoimmune diseases are system-wide, and these are going to include your multiple sclerosis, myasthenia gravis, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. Treatments for autoimmune diseases are, are again, they're usually, for most of these, are going to be anti-inflammatories and immunosuppressive drugs. There's also things like um, for thyroiditis, you can take thyroid hormone. Obviously, for type 1 diabetes, that's usually an insulin therapy. Um, there's many, many different drugs for like topical creams and stuff for psoriasis, for example. So there are other treatment options depending on which of these you are dealing with. Celiac disease is celiac disease is largely a disease of the small intestine, uh, and although other organs may be affected. But um, celiac disease can begin at any age. It results from a protein a protein hypersensitivity, usually gluten hypersensitivity. It's found mainly, gluten is found mainly in wheat, barley, rye, other types of grains. Celiac disease has several genetic causes, um, but it is poorly understood how environmental conditions influence the disease. What happens is, is on exposure to gluten, the body produces autoantibodies and an inflammatory response, and that inflammatory response in the small intestine leads to the uh, reduction in the depth of the microvilli in the mucosa, which hinders absorption, and it can lead to weight loss and anemia. The, the disease is also characterized by uh, a lot of abdominal pain and diarrhea, and a lot of times these symptoms are misdiagnosed as IBS, irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. So what we're looking at here is um, a comparison between the regular uh, healthy microvilli in the small intestine, and then this is what they look like in people that have celiac disease. So this is what leads to um, not being able to absorb the nutrients from the gluten. And then you have inflammation that causes all of the other symptoms that you see. Thyroiditis um, is something that, again, is personal to me. I happen to have hypothyroid, the Hashimoto's thyroidus, thyroiditis, and the book didn't have a good figure for it, I couldn't find, because it's, it's very similar to symptoms that you see for Graves' disease, except it's kind of backwards. So in figure 1913 here, they're showing a severe case of goiter. Goiter is when the thyroid itself is um, swollen. Now, I happen to have goiter but it doesn't look anything like this i mean this is woo, this is incredibly incredibly swollen um many people with hypothyroidism experience a, a dramatic range of symptoms and i can attest to this you have uh, low moods you have low energy right? extreme fatigue your hair and skin become brittle and dry you can lose your hair you have loss of memory you have difficulty, um, heck, I even have difficulty forming sentences sometimes. You can be irritable, your muscles become weakened, um, you can have low sex drive. I've, I myself have had a vitamin D deficiency, and then my hypothyroidism caused me to have insulin resistance, and then the insulin resistance aggravated the hypothyroid. So Hashimoto's, it doesn't get enough um, exposure you know people don't know very much about Hashimoto's and that I think is a shame because it does affect people on many many different with a very very different range of symptoms and, and it's since I was diagnosed I discovered at least four of my friends that also have the same condition but they never even thought to ask to be tested for it because they've never even heard of it now Graves disease Graves' disease is um, a severe, it's a more severe form of hyperthyroidism. So the autoimmune response leads to stimulation rather than inhibition of the thyroid tissue. So in Hashimoto's, you're having inhibition or destruction of thyroid glandular tissues. In Graves' disease, you're having stimulation 
So that means your thyroid is overactive. And just like other autoimmune diseases, Graves', Graves disease can be triggered by a viral infection. Um, it can be triggered because of certain genetic backgrounds. Affected patients, and they are usually women, they make autoantibodies that bind to you and stimulate receptors on the cytoplasmic membranes of the thyroid cells. And this elicits excessive production of the thyroid hormone and growth of the thyroid gland. So you can also get goiter with Graves' disease. Now, patients develop an enlarged thyroid. They have often have protruding, like, bugged out eyes. The scary thing is that they can have really rapid heartbeat. I have a family member with Graves' disease that at one, one point before she was diagnosed, her heart rate was over 200 beat, um, beats per minute, and it was terrifying. We all thought she was going to have a heart attack or a stroke, and we didn't know what was going on. It turns out it's her thyroid. Um, Graves' disease can also lead to fatigue, but it, it can, on the other end, lead to sleeplessness and insomnia. And... Um, also, weight loss, often really rapid weight loss, which is the opposite of what happens with Hashimoto. Hashimoto kind of slows everything down. Graves speeds everything up. Uh, physicians usually treat Graves' disease with antithyroid medications. In severe, pa in, severe case cases, in severe cases or when the patients don't respond to the medication, they may have to uh, remove the thyroid altogether. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, and it's another one that I don't think enough people know enough about. In fact, if I had my way, type 1 diabetes would be named something entirely different, because when people hear diabetes, they have a certain idea of what it is. But type 1 diabetes is, in fact, um, an immunological attack on the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas, and it results in the loss of the ability to produce insulin. And that is um, an autoimmune disease. And the exact trigger is unknown, like the exact cause is unknown. But many patients that have been diagnosed had previously had a severe viral infection some months before the onset of diabetes. Some patients have a genetic predisposition to developing type 1 diabetes. And it is associated with the possession of a certain class of major histocompatibility molecules. And some physicians have been successful in delaying the onset of type 1 diabetes by treating at-risk patients with immunosuppressive drugs before too much damage, too much damage to the islets becomes apparent. Um, again, this is another one that is near and dear to my heart. My daughter has type 1 diabetes. She was diagnosed when she was seven, and up to that point, I knew nothing about it. And now I like to tell everyone as much as I can that type 1 diabetes is not something that is caused by diet and exercise. It cannot be controlled by diet and exercise. It is a completely dis different disorder from type 2, and it has everything to do with your autoimmune function. Addison disease is... Uh, another name given for adrenal insufficiency. It is an uncommon disorder, but it, occur it occurs when your body doesn't produce enough of different hormones. It's, it's different in different individuals. But in Addison disease, your adrenal glands, which are located just above your kidneys, they do not produce enough cortisol, and often they don't produce enough aldosterone. So Addison's disease occurs in all age groups and in both sexes, and it can be life-threatening. So uh, treatment involves taking hormones to replace those that are not being produced naturally. Multiple sclerosis of the autoimmune diseases affecting nervous tissue. The most frequent is multiple sclerosis. The exact cause of MS is unknown, but... It appears that a cell-mediated immune response against a bacterium or against a virus generates cytotoxic T-cells, and the cytotoxic T-cells mistakenly attack and destroy the myelin sheath that normally insulate the brain and the spinal cord neurons, and this increases the speed of nerve impulses along the length of the neurons. Consequently, 
uh, multiple sclerosis patients experience deficits in vision, speech, and in neuromuscular function. That may be mild and intermittent, so they come and go, or uh, they become more persistent and can ultimately lead to death. Myasthenia gravis is characterized by weakness and rapid fatigue of any of the muscles under your voluntary control. And it's caused by a breakdown in the normal communication between nerves and muscles. Uh, Autoantibody is directed towards uh, acetylcholine receptors in the synaptic cleft of neuromuscular junctions are the major cause of this disorder. Uh, there's no cure, but treatment can help relieve signs and symptoms such as uh, weakness of arm or leg muscles, double vision, drooping eyelids, and difficulties with speech, chewing, swallowing, and breathing. Uh, though the disease can affect people of any age, it's more common in women that are younger than 40 and in men that are older than 60. Psoriasis is a chronic skin disorder. It's a systemic autoimmune disorder resulting from keratinocytes, dendritic cells, and T cells. The cytokines produced by all of these cells. And there are different types or classifications of psoriasis. You have plaque psoriasis, nail psoriasis, glutate psoriasis, inverse, postular, and erythrodermic psoriasis. Rheumatoid arthritis commences when B cells secrete the uh, IgM that binds to certain IgG molecules. So it makes an IgM IgG complex, and then these complexes are deposited in the joints where they activate complement and mast cells, and this releases inflammatory chemicals, and the resulting inflammation causes the tissues to swell and thicken and they proliferate into the joint, and this causes severe pain. As this altered tissue extends into the joint, the inflammation further erodes and destroys the cartilage between the joints, and then the neighboring bony structures um, begin to get eroded, and this happens until the joints become distorted and they lose their shape and their range of motion. The course of rheumatoid arthritis is often intermittent, so it will come and go, and with each occurrence, the, um, it gets worse. So which, with each reoccurrence, the lesions and the damage, they get progressively more severe. An example of a type 3 hypersensitivity disease that affects multiple organs is lupus. So this is when you have a generalized immunological disorder. It makes antibodies against numerous self-antigens found in normal organs and tissues. It gives rise to many different pathological lesions and uh, different manifestations. So one thing that is consistent about lupus is the development of these self-reactive antibodies, these autoantibodies that are against the nucleic acids, especially the DNA. So the, the autoantibodies combine with free DNA released from cells that have died, and it forms immune complexes that are deposited in the glomeruli, which causes the glomerulonephritis. And um, this is similar to what we saw with the, the kidney failure. The same thing can happen in lupus, and it can also cause arthritis. So lupus can cause other uh, autoimmune disorders. This is uh, figure 1918 showing systemic lupus, and it is also showing the very typical butterfly rash of lupus over here on the right. Again, uh, this table was too big really to show properly in this presentation, but it is in your book, and I recommend that you go through it. It summarizes very succinctly all of the different diseases that we just discussed, their causes and their signs and symptoms. It's all in one place there in the textbook. Section 19.3 of the book is discussing grafts and organ transplantation and the rejection of those things. So 
A graft is the transplantation of an organ or tissue to a different location with the goal of replacing the missing or damaged organ or tissue. Grafts are typically moved without their attachments to the circulatory system and must reestablish these, in addition to other connections and interactions with their new surrounding tissues. There's different types of grafts, depending on the source of the new tissue or organ. Tissues that are transplanted from one genetically distinct individual to another within the same species, this is called an allograft. An interesting variant of an allograft is the isograft. Isograft is uh, when tissue from one twin is transplanted to another twin. Twin, And as long as the twins are monozygotic, so they, they're identical twins, the transplanted tissue is virtually never rejected. If tissues are transplanted from one area on an individual to another area on the same individual, so this is like um, if you have a skin graft on a burn patient, this is known as an autograft. And then finally, if tissues from an animal are transplanted into a human, this is called a xenograft. The uh, different types of grafts have varying risks for rejection. Rejection occurs when the recipient's immune system recognizes the donor tissue as foreign and it triggers an immune response. The major histocompatibility complex markers, uh, the, the 1 and 2, are specifically identified as human leukocyte antigens and they play a role in the transplant rejection. So when rejection occurs, the dendritic cells will process and present the foreign, um, the foreign antigens to the host helper T cells and the cytotoxic T cells. So that activates them. The cytotoxic T cells will target and kill the grafted cells through the very same mechanism that they would use to kill virus infected cells. And your helper T cells release cytokines that activate, activate the macrophages that uh, also work to kill graft cells. Although matching the um, MHC genes between a donor and a recipient can lower the risk for graft rejection. There's a number of additional gene products that also play a role in stimulating response against grafted tissue. So because of this, no non-self-grafted tissue is likely to be completely uh, devoid of the risk of rejection. However, the more similar the MHC genes match, the more likely the graft is to be tolerated and to be tolerated for a longer time. So most transplant recipients, even those with tissues that are well matched, require treatment with immunosuppressant drugs for the rest of their lives. And this can make them more vulnerable than most people to complications from infectious disease and also can result in transplant related malignancies uh, because the body's normal defenses against cancer cells are being suppressed. So this table here, I just included this as a, a short summary of the different types of grafts and the potential for complications involved with those different types of grafts. And then this um, figure here is showing the different mechanisms that are involved in the rejections of an allograft. So again, allograft is when it's coming from an animal to a human. I'm sorry, an allograft is when it's going from the same species, right? The recipient, the recipient and the donor are the same species. And then that's comparing it to a xenograft, which is from an animal to a human species. So this here is the allograft, this is the xenograft. Okay. And then this here is again explaining the concept of MHC typing in order to reduce the likelihood of graft rejection. So the genes that are coding for host surface molecules that bind to peptide fragments that derived from pathogens, foreign antigens, and display them on host cells. So that's your major histocompatibility complex. We've discussed them in great detail in lessons one and two. Um, here they're giving them the name HLA, human leukocyte antigens. So these terms are used interchangeably when you're talking about autoimmune and hypersensitivity and transplant rejection. Um, following transplantation of a graft, the recipient mounts an immune response, and then the closer these HLA or MHC 
antigens are between the recipient and the donor, the better the likelihood is that the graft won't be rejected by the host's immune response. So non-self tissue transplantation um, in reducing the risk of rejection is also being aided by new technologies that involve stem cell research, in vitro organ production, so this is where they are actually making organs in the lab, and of course genetic modification. All of these things are being developed now. Some of them have been used, but there's a lot more work to be done here. It is a very exciting field of science, um, but yes, it, it's still all being researched and tested. Primary immunodeficiencies also known as inherited deficiencies. Um, these are caused by genetic abnormalities. They can result from flaws in phagocyte killing of innate immunity or impairment of T cells, impairment of B cells. Um, they can inherited deficiencies of individual immunoglobulin classes are more common than the deficiency of all classes. Among these, IgA deficiency is the most common. Because affected children cannot produce secretory IgA, they experience recurrent infections in the respiratory and gastrointestinal tracts. Now, um, some primary immunodeficiencies include chronic granulom granulomatous disease, X-linked gamma globulinemia, uh, <laughs> that one's tough, selective IgA deficiency, and severe combined immunodeficiency disease. Now, unlike inherited primary immunodeficiency diseases, acquired or secondary immunodeficiency diseases affect older individuals who had a previously healthy immune system. So your secondary or acquired immunodeficiencies come from uh, a number of causes. So in humans, the immune system it gen it generally deteriorates with increasing age. And as a result, older individuals normally have less effective immunity, especially cell-mediated immunity, than younger individuals. And this, this leads to an increased incidence of both viral diseases, certain types of cancer. Uh, severe stress can also lead to immunodeficiencies by prompting secretion of corticosteroids, which are toxic to T cells, and this also suppresses cell-mediated immunity. Um, it can result from environmentally induced effects in B cells, T cells, and these secondary immunodeficiencies can cause malnutrition and diabetes, type 2 diabetes, prolonged infection, and all kinds of other things. So let's have a look at some of these different types of immunodeficiencies. X-linked SCID. Um, so this is SCID is severe compromised immunodeficiency, and with X-linked SCID, this, this is accounting for nearly half of all cases, and it also occurs primarily in males. Patients with SCID are typically diagnosed within the first few months of their life, and usually after developing a severe, often life-threatening, opportunistic infection by Canada species, um, I'm sorry, Candida yeast species or uh, pneumocystis or pathogenic strains of E. coli. So this picture here, this figure 1919, his name is David Vetter. He was known as the bubble boy. In fact, when I was a kid back in the 80s, um, we heard about this cat all the time. And in fact, they made a movie about him starring John Travolta. I think he was in it. But um, yeah, this poor kid had to live his entire life. In, an, in a clean room, essentially, in a big plastic bubble, or with um, the suit that he's wearing here. He's actually getting out of the bubble for one of the very first times ever. I mean, this was on the news, you guys. It was amazing. But it, he couldn't go very far because he could only go as far as these little uh, tubes that were pumping air in and pumping CO2 out of his airtight suit. It's terrible. And he had to wear this because he was absolutely vulnerable to everything. There's bacteria everywhere, in the air and everywhere you go. It's, it's ubiquitous, and he could not be exposed to any of those things because he essentially did not have an immune system whatsoever. 
Of course, the most significant example of an acquired immunodeficiency is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, which you would know as AIDS. Uh, from the time of its discovery in 1981 to its emergence as a worldwide pandemic, no affliction has affected modern life as much as AIDS. AIDS is not a single disease, it's a syndrome, and what that means is it's a complex of signs and symptoms in different diseases that are associated with a common cause. Epidemiologists define AIDS as the presence of several opportunistic or rare infections along with infection by the human immunodeficiency virus, the HIV virus. Well, it's technically not correct to say HIV virus because virus is already in the name HIV. Anyway, HIV destroys helper T cells, which are also called CD4 cells when, when they're discussing uh, HIV and this causes fever, fatigue, severe weight loss, diarrhea, body aches. But the thing that is really bad is the fact that the immune system responds to the presence of HIV by producing antibodies, and then the number of free HIV variants plummets, and then as infection progresses, the body destroys almost a billion variants per day, but the virus and cytotoxic T cells kill 100 million CD4 cells per day, and eventually the number of the helper T cells, the CD4 cells, declines to a level that severely impairs the immune response, and the rate of antibody formation falls exponentially as the helper T cells function is lost, and then HIV produces, HIV production continues to climb, and then eventually the patient will die. Uh, many of the diseases associated with the loss of immune function in AIDS are non-lethal infections in other patients, but in AIDS patients, um, they cannot effectively resist them. They can't fight them off. So this is a nice table that summarizes the primary immunodeficiencies and the secondary immunodeficiencies that we discussed. So I'm going to discuss uh, cancer. Cancer involves the loss of the ability of cells to control their cell cycle. The stages of each cell, the stages that they go through and they grow and they divide. Um, so when they lose control of this division, the cells will rapidly divide and then they lose their ability to differentiate into the cell types that they were supposed to become and then they lose their ability to go to the location that they're supposed to be in the body. So they also lose contact inhibition when they start to grow on top of each other. And what happens is there's the formation of a tumor. And so a tumor is a cell that has divided improperly. It is divided way too fast, and sometimes it's not going to the place in the body where it's supposed to be. So it's important to make a distinction here. that The term cancer is used to describe the diseases resulting from the loss of cell cycle regulation, but the term tumor is its more general. A tumor is an abnormal mass of cells, and a tumor can be benign or malignant. So if the tumor is benign, it's not cancerous. If it is malignant, it is cancerous. Adaptive and innate immune responses are triggered by the tumor antigens. The cell molecules are only found on abnormal cells. The helper T cells activate cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells of the innate immunity that's, that it tries to seek out and destroy cancer cells. Now, traditional cancer treatment uses radiation or chemotherapy to destroy cancer cells. However, these treatments, they have a lot of unwanted side effects because they harm normal cells as well as cancer cells. But uh, newer promising therapies are in the works. Some of these that are being developed involve um, eliminating the cancers using the body's own defenses before they can become a problem. Now, this, this idea is not universally accepted by researchers, and it needs a lot more investigation. Cell-mediated immune responses can be directed against cancer cells. Um, abnormal cancer cells can present tumor antigens. The tumor antigens are not part of the screening process used to eliminate lymphocytes during development. So even though they are self-antigens, they can stimulate and drive adaptive immune response against abnormal cells. But like I said, this, this is still 
this is all still being developed. And despite the mechanisms that have been used and are likely to be used in the future for removing cancerous cells, cancer remains a common cause of death. Uh, unfortunately, malignant tumors tend to actively suppress the immune system in many ways. The immune cells themselves are cancerous in many cases. In leukemia, the lymphocytes that would normally facilitate immune response become abnormal. In other cancers, the cancerous cells become resistant to um, apoptosis. 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 This may occur through the expression of membrane proteins that shut off cytotoxic T cells. Um, the mechanisms by which cancer cells alter immune responses are still not yet fully understood. It's a very, very active area of research. Um, as scientists' understanding of adaptive immunity improves, the cancer therapies will improve. But uh, we are in the stage now where we are developing preventative cancer vaccines. So there are two types of cancer vaccines. We have preventative and we have therapeutic. Okay, so let's let's break those two down. Preventative vaccines are used to prevent cancer from occurring. Uh, therapeutic vaccines are used to treat vaccines that already have cancer. Most preventative vaccines target viral infections that are known to lead to cancer. So these are going to be vaccines against the HPV, human papillomavirus, and uh, your hepatitis B. And this also this this helps. So it targets the viruses themselves, but it also helps prevent cervical and liver cancer. Um, therapeutic cancer vaccines are still in the experimental stage. They exploit tumor-specific antigens that stimulate the immune system to selectively attack cancer cells. So specifically, therapeutic cancer vaccines aim to enhance Th1 function and interaction with cytotoxic T cells, which in turn results in more effective uh, and a more effective attack on abnormal tumor cells by the host's immune system. In some cases, researchers, researchers have uh, been able to use genetic engineering to develop anti-tumor vaccines, and this approach is similar to that used for DNA vaccine. Um, the vaccine contains a recombinant plasmid that has genes for tumor antigens, and again, it's still experimental, but theoret theoretically, the tumor the tumor gene would not induce new cancer because it's not functional, but it could trick the immune system into targeting the tumor gene product as a foreign invader. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos below, the description below for more videos related to these topics, and uh, leave your questions for me in the comments section.